It's time now for the big question in which we tackle a major news story of the day. Tonight, in a recent poll, over 50 percent of leavers have said they believe that Brexit was a mistake. Is it too soon to judge our departure from the European Union, given the fact that we've had the unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? Has Brexit cost the economy dear? Are we all the poorer for it? Or was Brexit the important fulfilment of a democratic mandate which has restored sovereignty to our shores and insulated us against the worst excesses of the EU? Is the best of Brexit yet to come? Well, let's hear from both sides, as we always do on The Big Question. I'm delighted to welcome senior fellow at UK for a Changing Europe, Professor Jonathan Portes, and former UKIP MEP broadcaster and political commentator, uh, the wonderful uh, Stephen Wolf. Um, Stephen, if I could start with you, uh, has Brexit been a mistake? No, Brexit certainly wasn't a mistake. It was one of the most magnificent and wonderful examples of democracy across the globe that we've had, not only in my generation, but actually in the past hundreds of years, which enabled ordinary people to be able to take a chance and tell the elites of our country that they're in the wrong direction, that they weren't listening to them, Stephen and Wolf. it is about time that they did. Wolf. And Brexit itself hasn't failed because Brexit really hasn't been tried. Brexit's been stifled. Brexit's been stymied. Brexit has been trammeled by those same elites who just cannot accept, they just cannot accept that they were wrong and that ordinary people, predominantly the poorest in the country, predominantly the working class northerners and Midlands and those on the coast, predominantly those who are not in the 5% income earners of this country like Jonathan, who's going to oppose me in a minute, are, Predominantly, they're not the elites, and they're the ones who've had to watch a political establishment, a civil service establishment, and business people who just don't believe in it because they're global trot trotters who don't believe in the poor, have ignored them, and they're trying to make sure that it never, ever happens in any positive way whatsoever. Uh, Jonathan Portes, good to have you back on the show as well. Um, surely Brexit has been a success because it happened and a democratic mandate was fulfilled. Yes, I mean, I agree with that. It's rather odd you describe me as a passionate Remainer. I've never um, stated a preference for Brexit or against Brexit from a political point of view. I'm an economist. It's not my job. Um, I don't expect people to be particularly interested in my views about sovereignty. It's mm. perfectly reasonable to say uh, that sovereignty was a big concern. It's perfectly reasonable to say we had a democratic vote and that Brexit happened as a consequence. I have no problem with any of that. Mm. Um, I'm just here, as I understand it, to talk about the facts and what the economics say. So let's get to it. First, I'll just correct Stephen, though, on this point about who voted. Well, listen, we'll, we'll, we're going to unilaterally remove the label Remainer. Um, and as a top economics professor, you're concerned about the economic impact of Brexit. And I, I can't imagine you would, would have voted for Brexit. We can agree on that, Jonathan. Um, well, uh, as I said, I mean, I think I said before the vote that Brexit would have that there were good arguments for and against Brexit on political and sovereignty grounds. And I stand by that. There are arguments okay. on both sides there. Um, on economic grounds, however, it was always clear. There was always an absolute consensus across the ideological spectrum among serious economists, economists of trade, that Brexit would not be catastrophic from an economic point of view, and I don't think it has been catastrophic from an economic point of view, but that would do some significant economic damage. It would make trade more difficult, and that would make us poorer. And um, I'm afraid on this, the experts were right. It hasn't been a catastrophe. It has made trade more difficult, and it's made us somewhat poorer. There's no real doubt about that. No one seriously disputes it. No serious economist really disputes it. Those are just the facts. Now, it's perfectly reasonable for Stephen to say, well, it's still worth it. The cost was worth it you know, because we've got our sovereignty back in certain respects. I have no problem with that position at all. Um, we just need to get the facts right. Uh, Stephen Wolf, would you like to respond to that, that politically uh, Brexit is justified, but not economically? That's Jonathan Portes's point. Well, I, I agree with Jonathan in the sense that what we have seen since Brexit occurs and politically I, I believe it is absolutely right that we should have a nation that is sovereign to itself, just as many other nations are across the globe. But where Jonathan and I probably disagree is that I don't think that we've really had 
the strength of will within our political elite or indeed those within the civil service to try and ensure that the potential benefits that were out outside of the European Union could work. I remember very clearly that on the day of, of Brexit, I, we were going to be told there would be an immediate recession, mass unemployment, mass increase of interest rates and inflation. Well, I mean. Those were what uh, Cameron, Osborne, the Bank of England, the World Economic, all of them said that would happen the day that we left. And it didn't happen the day that we left. Well, a lot of these have occurred I, I, I since. Mean, a, a lot of these have occurred since then, and that's down to things such as COVID, the the implications prior to the war in Ukraine, the implications since the Ukraine. But where I would say that Jonathan and I would agree is that in terms of trade and the friction, vis-a-vis -vis Northern Ireland, for example, is because there just has not been anyone strong enough, and Boris certainly wasn't strong enough at the time, to force through the decisions of separating ourselves from the European Union's regulations, we still have that argument today, many of our rules still follow the EU, and without that separation from the EU, we cannot move forward rapidly enough, or indeed, to take benefit of Brexit. Uh, Jonathan, let's let's look at the, the numbers and let's look at the economy, uh, which uh, you understandably want to focus on. Well, we no longer pay the best part of £22 billion a year to Brussels. Uh, we also won't have to share the cost of the EU's pandemic response, which some have suggested could be in excess of £100 billion for the UK alone. Those are bills we're now not paying. Um, well, of course, we got most of that £22 billion back in the rebate and in spending that came here. And of course, you can hear the complaints up and down the country now from uh, those local authorities in those areas that are now missing out on that spending. So, of course, it goes both ways. But yes, we have made some savings. Um, on the other hand, um, those have been, uh, and again, the, the numbers are pretty clear on this, hugely outweighed by the reduction in our GDP, the reduction in trade, and hence the reduction in tax revenues. You can look at the government, and of course, this is a government led by people who voted for Brexit, the government's own economic analysis, which says, as a result of Brexit, we have less tax revenue, so you are paying more tax and getting worse public services than you otherwise would have of Brexit. Those are just facts. But let me come back to some things on which I agree with Steve. First of all, I think Stephen was a, is absolutely right that Cameron and Osborne talked a lot of nonsense. And economists, including me, and I can point back to what I said at the time, that they were scaremongering, that the damage from Brexit would be over the mm -hmm. medium to long term, not an immediate recession. And that, of course, is indeed what has happened. So I think he's right there. And second, another point where Stephen and I might agree, at least in part, Stephen talked a lot during the campaign, and I remember because uh, we uh, we had some panel discussions about moving to a system where we did, for immigration purposes, we treated people coming from inside the EU and outside the EU equally. And that indeed is what, the, you know, so that is something where we have made a big break. You know, we have taken the advantage of being outside the EU, have entirely our own system. We now have an immigration system that treats people from inside the EU and outside the EU equally. And somewhat to my surprise, and I have to admit I was wrong about this, it's actually led to more immigration, if anything, rather than less. We saw in the latest figures that immigration overall has gone up, especially people coming here to work in the National Health Service, to work in finance. And, and actually, on the whole, I, mean, you know, I thought that the, new, the changes to immigration would be a big negative, and I was wrong. I mean, I'm not, you know, there are pluses and minuses, but actually it hasn't worked out so badly. I Jonathan, I've, would agree. I, I want to come back to Stephen. I've only got a couple of seconds left. Can I just ask you uh, about whether we're judging Brexit too quickly? Because you're an economist. It's a massive shock to leave a block like that, and that really you can only judge Brexit uh, in the medium to long term, after a decade or two decades. And also, uh, Britain has not fallen over since uh, we left. And in fact, uh, I understand that we were the fastest growing economy in the G7 last year. So it's not shoddy. Well, no, uh, on the second point, let's be clear, we fell significantly more than others during the pandemic. We've recovered more slowly. So we're now the only country that's has still a lower level of output than before the pandemic. So looked over the whole period, we clearly have underperformed, no, no one disputes that. But on your main point, uh, I think that's perfectly fair. Um, so far, the impacts of Brexit have been broadly what we predicted, they've been negative. But in over 10 or 20 years, could we revise our views as the more facts come in and things change? 
Um, yes, I think that's a perfectly reasonable point to make. We will, as economists, be doing this analysis for at least the next 10, 20 years. Absolutely. Uh, Stephen Wolfe, uh, the last word. Uh, this is, I think, particularly about the economy, because that's what my viewers care about. It's the cost of living, it's the pound in their pocket, job security and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, in the end, has Brexit succeeded? Has it failed? What's your prognosis for Brexit? Will it succeed? My prognosis is that, as I said before, Brexit has been stifled and there is a great opportunity for us to grow in, in the future. JP Morgan, during their analysis of the referendum, said that there would be a fall in e economic terms, but in the long term, they could see also that Brexit would grow. But my view is that Bre Brexit will only succeed once we are able to disalign ourselves from the European Union's regulations as a whole, just choosing those small portions that we want to. If we don't, then we will be trapped in the negative spiral rather than the positive that I believe the country could go to in the future. Jonathan, Stephen, a cracking debate. Uh, my thanks to Professor Jonathan Portes, Senior Fellow at UK for a Changing Europe. Not a Remainer, uh, just somebody that's focusing on the economics of the issues around Brexit. And former UKIP MEP, uh, broadcaster and political commentator Stephen Wolfe. Gentlemen, thank you for that. Your reaction, Mark, thank at you. gbnews.uk.